John Hartson was known as a hard man of football. He signed for Luton Town aged 16 and went on to become a goal machine for eight different clubs and his country, Wales, being managed by and playing alongside some of the biggest names in football. So let's go back to the beginning. Tell us about your upbringing and your family. Well, <coughs> I had a brilliant upbringing in Swansea, um, one of four children, my brother and my two sisters. We lived in a council house um, all my life, uh, basically um, running around the streets and youth club and, um, and play scheme on, on the school holidays and all this stuff. Really, really happy upbringing. Uh, my mum and dad never, ever laid a finger on us physically or... Um, you know, my dad was the boss of the house. He was the breadwinner. But saying that, my mum, my mum worked in the psychiatric hospital, um, which is a really difficult job. You know, dealing with people that have been taken off the streets because they're psychotic and um, they need 24-hour care. So my mum had a really difficult, and she worked nights. Um, but my mum and dad, fantastic. They did everything for us. Um, you know, to try and make sure that. You know, we had a holiday every summer. Um, my dad used to have this old van and he had a roof rack and we'd all jump in the back of the van and he'd put the, he'd put the cases on the roof rack um, and we'd go down to, say, Tenby in West Wales and we'd go and stay in a caravan because we never went abroad and places like this. But I have to say my upbringing was, was brilliant and my parents couldn't have been any nicer to us. And supportive as well. They encouraged you into football, particularly your dad. And it was 16 years old when you signed for Luton Town. So your mum and dad drive you down to Luton and drop you off. What, what's it like as a footballer in that situation? Is it exciting or scary? Well, it, it was a, a great opportunity for me because I'd, you know, I'd had these dreams um, as a young boy growing up in Swansea <coughs> to hopefully get an opportunity to go to a football club at 16 to start what you'd call an apprenticeship or a, or a scholarship or a YTS scheme. And um, I got an opportunity at Luton and then um, I went up there at 16, lived with a family. Um, and at 17, I was, I, I'd made an immediate impact on a football club and I, I got into the first team very young. Um, but Luton was a, a great upbringing. It was old school in terms of we had to clean the stands and we had to clean the players' boots. We all got um, we all got a professional that we had. Every single one of the youth team players had to personally get his kit out for him, make sure his boots were, were shining for everyday training. Uh, I remember the youth team coach used to go around the top of the dressing room, the hooks, and just run his finger for dust and things like that. I always remember that vaguely. Um, my youth team coach Terry Wesley, who was always great for me. Uh, Terry's working now at uh, West Ham uh, with, with the under 21s, I believe. And uh, but Luton was great. Luton was just a really special place um, because it was where it all started. And David Fleet then, of course, gave me my debut at 19. And it wasn't long before the big clubs were looking at you, and you moved to Arsenal, most expensive teenager in British history, 2.5 million. George Graham's Arsenal, and what a team you joined! It was a great team. It, it was almost well. It was the England back four. It was David Seaman, Dixon, Adams, Keown, Boldy, Winterburn, John Jensen, um, Ray Parler, Merson, Bergkamp, Wright, Smith, Campbell, um, Selly. Great, great club. Um, and they were fantastic with me. I was only 19. I was walking in that dressing room. And I remember George Graham said to me on the Friday I signed, he took me upstairs. Um, we come through the marble halls, Highbury, the marble floors. and went upstairs into Ken Fryer's office and George is there and he said, John, he said, Kevin Campbell's got injured this morning. Alan Smith is struggling with his knee. He said, if you sign for me today, son, um, he said, you play out there on Highbury. There was sort of glass in the office and you could look in onto Highbury. He said, if you sign for me today, he says, you'll play out there tomorrow with the current England centre forward, who of course was Ian Wright. Mm -hmm. So I basically said, right, who wears the contract, you know? It wasn't really about money. I never even thought about money back then. I was 19, I was, I was going to make money during my career. Um, and I signed and I made my debut on that Saturday. We played Everton, mm -hmm. uh, playing against my big mate, Neville Southall, who was in goal for Everton. Duncan Ferguson got sent off um, for Everton and Ian Wright scored the goal for us. And we drew the game 1-1, so that was me 
made my debut on the Saturday, quickly pushed into the team, um, got to quickly know the lads. Tony Adams was brilliant, brilliant captain, a real, a real man amongst men. Everybody loved uh, Tony and um, Wrighty and then Bergkamp joined then the following season. So Arsenal was just great, great memories. We got to the UEFA um, Cup Winners Cup final and managed to get a goal. Um, the famous goal, Naeem from the halfway line, beat the world's number one goalkeeper at the time, David Seaman. Um, so that was a bit of a shame, but Ars Arsenal was great, great memories. And George Graham wasn't there too long after you signed. He left under quite controversial circumstances and Bruce Rioch took over. What was your relationship like with him? Not great with Bruce. I don't know why, but we, we just didn't quite um, get on as, as well as we should have really, manager and player. I was very young, I was very boisterous. Um, I played with Bruce's son, Greg, in the Luton youth team. So I knew Bruce before he came to Arsenal. I used to go down to his house in Harpenden with his son, Greg, and um, uh, Bruce's wife, Greg's mum, used to make us food and things like that. And I don't know whether Greg got, I think he went on to Wigan, he might, I uh, don't think he had, um, a too sex successful career, not being disrespectful of Greg, I love Greg Rioch, he's a good lad. Um, but maybe it was because maybe Bruce, I was at Arsenal, and Greg maybe was a little bit further down the ladder, and I just felt he was a bit personal, some of the stuff that he used to do to me and say to me. Maybe looking back, you know, maybe I was a little bit young, a bit paranoid, um, and maybe I should have done things a little bit better, but we didn't see eye to eye. We never quite got on. So the day that Bruce was sacked, it was like it was. I was really overjoyed without sounding disrespectful or, or nasty. I just felt I could make a fresh start now under a manager that um, that I could go and impress the new manager. And uh, uh, from Bruce Rioch, it was Arsene Wenger, and I had a brilliant relationship with Arsene Wenger. Me and Wrighty played up top and Dennis played in the hall several times. He never wanted me to leave Arsenal. Arsene Wenger, there was a new contract on the table there that I only needed to go and see David Dean and it was ready there, a new contract at Arsenal for me to sign. But I had Harry Redknapp and West Ham on the phone. They wanted to sign me at 21 and um, I eventually ended up going to West Ham. Just going back to Arsene Wenger though, he came in with some quite new ways that have probably been rolled out more across the board now, but what did you make of them at the time? And, and what sort of things did he do that might have surprised you? Well, <coughs> um, he just basically, um, Arsene Wenger, the training became more structured. He did everything with a watch. Um, we would do six or seven laps of the training ground every morning before we started training, just to get the lactic acid out of your body and your legs. Um, great coach, would take players 1v1, clearly very, very intelligent. I never heard him swear once, a complete gentleman. Um, and the players loved him, the players absolutely loved him, uh, the senior players as well. And I think they will now say to you themselves that Arsene Wenger added two or three years on top of their careers because they really tuned into the, the diet, the, the foods that we were getting, um, the stretching after training every day. We would go into a room and Arsene Wenger would, would stand in the middle. We would form a big circle and he'd go through all the, the stretches and, um, and the lads tuned in to, to the philosophy that what Arsene wanted. And, um, and what was a bit of a shame, really, was I, I left Arsenal. It wasn't a shame because I'm, I'm, I'm happy I went to West Ham because I had a good time there. And I worked with some great players. And obviously, Harry Redknapp has become a great friend of mine um, over the years. Harry, who signed me. But I left Arsenal in 97. And they won the double in 98. So if I'd stayed and been a bit more patient, because it was Wrighty and Dennis that was keeping me out, Dennis Bergkamp, obviously, and Ian Wright, two of the greatest at the time. Um, I might have been sitting here with a double winner's medal now, and I'd have played with the great Henri and Petit, and Vieira was there, of course. I forgot to say Patrick then was in the squad. Um, so it was one of them things, you know, I can't do nothing about it now, but maybe if I know now what I might have known at 21, um, 
I may well have stayed at Arsenal for a few more years. But Harry Redknapp came along and he offered you first team football every week, guaranteed. Yeah. You seem to be a player that kind of thrives on confidence in you. I'm, I'm a confidence person. I think most of us are. If I walk into a room, even now, um, I'll go and sit at the back. I won't necessarily sit at the front. You know, I, I think we all thrive on a bit of confidence. We all work better when we're confident. I've done shows for television companies and I'm not too comfortable with the presenter and I'm not as confident and I don't come across as, as well. And then I go to another show, me and the presenter, we're good friends. He asks me the right things. He brings me in at the right times and I'm flying mm -hmm. and I come across great and I'm relaxed and I, I can deal with the cameras and things like this. Um, so I think we all thrive a little bit on confidence. I was quite shy, believe it or not. Whenever the manager dug me out in the dressing room, I'd go bright red and I'd go a little bit embarrassed. Um, but in time, obviously, I've picked up a lot more confidence as, as the years have gone by with the, some of the clubs I played for um, and everything else that you just have to get on with your life. And sometimes you've got to be confident for your kids, you know. Um, but I was, I struggled with confidence initially early on, but then Harry gave me the confidence to go and lead the line at West Ham be the main player, built his team around me, and um, I had great success there, especially that first season with 24 goals, which was my best in the Premier League. You rewarded him with lots of goals, and uh, you guys had a, a great relationship. Of course, he's now the king of the jungle. That's right. Have you Brilliant. spoken to him about it? I haven't spoken to him. I probably couldn't get hold of him. Um, he's probably really busy. I've heard he's doing a new book and everything, but uh, good luck to him. You know, he's a, he's a great guy. Did you watch it? I watched bits, snippets of it, yeah. Um, my wife's a big fan, she watches it, she tapes it and everything. Um, so I was delighted for him because he is, you know, he, he showed the public that, what you know, that softer side to him. And I think everybody's fallen in love with him since the jungle. Um, but no, he was great when he signed me back then, you know, long time ago now, seems like a long time ago. Um, he gave me the confidence, as I said, and uh, he's a character. We used to go to Waltham Store Dogs together on a Thursday night. Me and Harry Redknapp, my manager. Harry would have, you know, we'd both have a little bit of a steak, I'd have a glass of cork, he'd have a, he'd have a glass of wine. And, um, you know, we, we, we liked a little bet back then. Um, that's common knowledge. Uh, but it was, you know, that's the type of relationship we had. You know, players wouldn't, you wouldn't see Pep Guardiola go into the Manchester dog track with Raheem Sterling, would you? Now? Definitely not, <laughs> no. unfortunately. But that back, at, back then, you know, there was no cameras, there was none of this social media, all this sort of stuff. And Harry could meet me, you know, in a hotel and we'd go to the dogs and we'd come home and nobody would know about it apart from the people that were there. <laughs> so that was great. It was around that time that you also became a bit of a man to watch for the tabloids. You got yourself involved in a few incidents, including a, a late night incident in a bar with your uncle. I know. Finally leading Keith. you astray. Oh, what did Harry say, though, about that? Well, he wasn't too happy about it. And I just think, you know, going through a career, um, you know, some things I, I regret, but... I think a lot of it as well shapes you for what you are, I think. Um, you know, I'm now 43. I think the one good thing about getting older is that you get a bit wiser. You make better decisions, you, you keep better company, um, you tend to leave at the right time and you don't go to certain places that potentially, you know, um, can be a bit of a nightmare. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, you're first in there, you're last out, you know, it's. Um, I grew up on a council estate with a group of guys that, you know, like to have a drink and go out and enjoy themselves. And for a long time, I remained one of the boys. Um, and I did things that they did, although I was a professional footballer. But knowing what I know now, as you say, a bit more mature, a bit more grown up. But at that particular time, you know, you make mistakes. You do make mistakes along the way. And I made, I made a few, but... Um, you know, over the piece, over the career, there's not a lot of things I would regret. You stole a hanging basket, got you in a bit of trouble. Yeah, I know, but there's, there's 30 hanging baskets that'll be <laughs> that'll be stolen this weekend and it won't get a mention because it's John Hartson, because I'm in Swansea. Let's get him in. Let's make him in. Let's make a headline of this one. Probably the worst of it, and I would assume one of your biggest regrets was the incident with Eyal Berkovic on the training ground. That was... He made it to the press. That, that was a really... Um, 
a regrettable incident because uh, although I was I was physical, I was quite aggressive. I, I enjoyed that physical side of the game. Um, it was wrong to lash out and do what I did to Isle. Although he hit me first, if you look at the video, he threw a punch at me, and then I reacted, reacted in the wrong way. It was on it was on camera. Somebody had filmed it. Somebody then went and put it out there. It went viral. And I had a lot of bad publicity, and you know, I, I felt for my family because they were not used to that. You know, there was press knocking my parents' door in Swansea and um, things like this. But it was a lesson, and as I said, I've not got that many regrets. But that was an incident that that I wish hadn't happened. And I always felt that slightly went before me then. I'm, I was 21. It was like more than half my lifetime ago. I'm 43 now, and people, you know my 30 odd goals in 60 odd games for West Ham and I played my part in keeping them up. People tend to not mention the good things and people like to sort of revel in the misdemeanors. But for Roy Keane, all Roy's magnificent career, people like to talk about when he walked away from Ireland and um, when he ended a player's career. It's like, talk about the good things. And I, I've always had to, I've always had to answer them questions because I think people generally like to know about, you know, the the stuff that went wrong. Do you know what I mean? Um, but as I said, I'm, I'm, I've held my hands up. I take full responsibility for that incident, and I, it's one that I did regret and, and look back and think I wish it never happened. A moment of madness. Yes, absolutely. Possibly was a factor in you leaving West Ham. You went to Wimbledon next, where I'd imagine the antics on the training ground were much more sedate. Well, they were, but what happens on the training ground stays on the training ground, <laughs> as you know. Um, but there was a great bunch of lads. Obviously, I'd, I'd missed the crazy gang era in terms of Dennis Wise and, and Vinnie Jones and, and Fash and Dave Besant, all the, all the guys that were there at the time. Um, but we still had some great characters. We had Marcus Gale, we had Robbie Earle, who was brilliant. Ben Thatcher, Andy Roberts, Alan Kimball, Kenny Cunningham, Neil Sullivan, Carl Court, um, great lads. Really, really, Neil Ardley, of course, who's just moved out of his post as a Wimbledon manager, gone up to Notts County. Neil was a great lad, good player. Um, but we had great fun. Joe Kinnear paid an awful lot of money for me, £7.5 million, pounds, and Sam Haman, um, which almost shook, shook the football world at the time. It was so much money. And you look back now, you know, that was that was 1999. And what's that? It's like oh, 20 years ago. That's 85 million now in today's market, yeah, you know, yeah. if, you, if you think of the years. So um, I had a few injuries at Wimbledon. Um, tough time a, there. A little bit of a tough time there, yeah. And my first, my first, my little girl was born in Hatfield. I was living in Brookmans Park. I was driving right the way around the M25 to go training every day. And um, but nothing but good times again. Really, had a few injury problems. We we got relegated. I I commented again on that relegation, which I sh should have kept my big mouth shut. Really, Eggie Olsen came to the club. who was an absolute gentleman. Um, he really, really was. He had a certain style of playing. He loved a big centre forward, so that suited my style. We got the ball from front to back really quickly. Myself, Marcus Gale, and Carl Court were the three up front three six foot three you know big guys um so wimbledon was an experience um but again no regrets about joining wimbledon i went as well for joe Kinnear, mick arford who was my hero he was a coach so no regrets about going to wimbledon it was when you came to leave wimbledon that problems started occurring in your career problems that you didn't expect at the time and on the pitch, obviously, it was difficult. I think four um, clubs you were going to sign for that turned you down <coughs> because you failed in medical when you thought you had no problems. And off the pitch, that was a really hard time for you. It was because I'm thinking there's nothing wrong with my knee here. I'm, I'm doing all the training. I'm doing all the drills. That's expected me of me in training. But whenever you s scanned my knee, something showed up that... Um, that made the cl put the clubs off signing me because they thought this knee ain't gonna last. You know, it's something there. Um, medically, it didn't stand up to what was the criteria, what they were looking for. Um, and I failed a big medical at Spurs for seven million pounds. So that would have meant I was going 
Arsenal, West Ham, Wimbledon, Spurs. Failed that medical, Dr. King. David Pleat, Chief Executive. George Graham, Manager, Alan Sugar, Chairman. Spent the day having a medical, failed that one. I would have gladly have signed for Spurs. Wouldn't have bothered me about playing for other London clubs. It would have been a proud moment for me. Then I went to Rangers, Glasgow Rangers, which again, the way things have worked out, my five years, my 110 goals for Celtic, yeah. they're big rivals. That was probably, looking back, one of the best uh, things that have happened to me. But at the time, uh, it really hurt to fail the medical. Because if I hadn't have failed that medical, I wouldn't have had the chance to sign for Celtic and had the career that I had and the success I had playing for Celtic. Um, Charlton, Alan Kirbishley, spent the day with Alan Kirbishley, failed that medical. And then I failed the medical initially at Coventry. And then Coventry then did a deal with Wimbledon that they pay Wimbledon as I play. And I had a brilliant six months for Coventry, proved my fitness. And then in the summer, uh, we went down at Coventry, got relegated. In that summer, I went to Celtic and joined Martin O'Neill uh, for six million pounds, which, which was great. And you were literally hero worshipped at Celtic, weren't you? Was the feeling mutual? Uh, yeah, I, I love the club. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a special club. The fans were unbelievable. When I was ill, they were, they were brilliant. When I was playing there, I had five great years. Uh, met my wife, Sarah, while I was uh, in Glasgow. Um, and it's, uh, it's an unbelievable club. The volume, the size of the fan base worldwide. We had a great team, got to the UEFA Cup final in 2003. Won, I think I won seven trophies, I won three league trophies, individual honours for goals. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed my, my five years with, with Celtic Football Club. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just a great place to play your football.